So, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim and Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Everyone, we are in the course. It's called Pearls of the Prophet. So, the, the title, Pearls of the Prophet, it was really inspired by the whole idea. In what I was trying to do, if the Prophet was, of course, amongst us, what would he say? What would he tell us? And that many times, I think people would hear a hadith and they don't recognize that this is the Prophet ﷺ and that's what he was explaining, the revelation that is the Qur'an for you. He's giving you the tips on how to apply it. He's giving you the tips on what to do. He's giving you right there a straightforward, detailed instruction and direction on how to live the revelation. The revelation, the Quran, can sometimes, I would say, yes, it's a short message, but can sometimes contain a lot of ambiguity on how do I actually apply that? And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that he had sent the Qur'an وَمِثْلَهُ معه, That he had sent the Qur'an in something that is similar to it, which is basically the Sunnah, the Prophet ﷺ, to explain the details, to help us see the light, to help us know how to apply the light. That's what the Sunnah is. But unfortunately... Many would think that the word sunnah just means that it's something that is recommended to take as an inspiration and not necessarily that you have to take or that you have to apply or that you have to embrace or that you are supposed to take, take seriously. Well, that is one thing I'll be talking about. Well, what is the reason behind that? Um, so when we're looking at the pearls of the Prophet Sallam, in class, we're generally going to be taking different hadith that relate to different subjects. It's all about how we're supposed to redirect our focus, reorient our vision, redirect our behavior, redirect our mind redirect our heart, redirect our body. So what I was trying to do, I'm tr I was trying to look into different angles. Everyone's talking about mental health and mindfulness, but I think it is not talked about oftentimes from the Islamic perspective, from the Hadith perspective. In the reason why I wanted to bring up the hadith perspective is because the hadith itself, it basically is the human-to-human -human talk, trying to simplify how we understand revelation. The Qur'an is divine to human. The sunnah is human-to-human, human, trying to help you see through the lens of Quran. The lens of Quran was basically the inspiration that the Prophet ﷺ was talking to us through. So when you're looking at these pearls, you're seeing pearls of light. They're pearls of light to help us see through the revelation, through the light that was coming directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when we look at the pearls of light, those gems, those, those uh, uh, pearls of guidance in where to help us understand how do we embrace the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How do we live those words? So we would look at those different stations. Station one is basically going to be the station of redirecting our vision. Before you go on any mission, before you set off to take any type of a, a travel or a journey, the first thing you ask yourself, okay, do I have everything with me to help me go on to the journey? 
Yes, good. Now, do you know where you're going? Because if you don't know where you're going, you don't set your GPS on the destination, then you're just driving recklessly and you don't know where you're going. So we would have to redirect and reorient our vision. So that's where, of course, we will start in talking about, <clears throat> inshallah, the intention, and we'll go into details in that regards. But we're not going to talk about it like it's a class about intention. No, not at all. We're just going to go and talk about the different hadith and specifically the different authentic hadith. If you're capable of memorizing those hadith, that would be great. That's considerate like the real thing that you would really want to put yourself at based on your level. If you're capable, you don't have to race with someone else because other people like Sister Umayya, well, she's got an Islamic studies degree, okay? But someone else might not have an Islamic studies degree, doesn't speak Arabi, it's going to be a little bit challenging. So I don't want you to challenge necessarily with others, but challenge with yourself. Can I memorize all the hadith? Is this something you're capable of doing? If that's too much of a big challenge, can I memorize half the hadith? If that's still too much of a challenge for you, can you memorize one hadith a day? If that's too much of a challenge for you, can you memorize one hadith every two days? Can you memorize one hadith every three days? Even if you just memorize one hadith related to the topic, that's at least what we want to get from the hadith, uh, our hadith class. So the pearls of the prophet, we're going to go in some details regards to some hadith in, uh, inshallah, in a number of different structures. Let me just give you as well the other screen so we could see what that looks like. Let's see. So we're going to be, you could see that those are the hadith and uh, it's going to be covering, redirecting our vision. We've got the hadith, we'll have the translation, and then we'll also get to see, of course, those hadith. I know they're kind of plenty, but the good news is that they're all authentic. The least is Hassan, not weak. I tried to focus on that. That way we won't feel that this is going to be hectic. I will give you this material, so don't, don't don't stress. And we'll also look at, well, not only the Prophet ﷺ in his commentary, but we'll also see some of those Sahaba, some of those Salihin, and how they, uh, how they had seen and how they saw the, the, the inspiration in how we would practice such words. So we would basically look at some of their words and some of what they had taught us as well. So then we'll basically give you some time as well, um, not only in how we or how I would see the inspiration and talk about it from there, but we would also like to see you tell us what you had gotten out of this. I'm not going to be choosing randomly. So uh, at the end of the class, I would like to see those hands up and say, hey, this is what I had seen. This is what I had learned. And give us your, uh, I guess, your inspiration and share it with us. So we would, I don't want to just make it me talking. I will be reading the Hadith in Arabi and then I'll translate. But here's one thing. I won't translate. I won't always read the translation directly. I will put my cursor. And as you could see, I, I will um, hover around with the cursor and actually read the words and comment perhaps on a specific term here and there and so forth. But before we talk about, of course, all those ahadith and go into those ahadith, it would be important to talk about, well, what is a hadith. No, we talked about it yesterday, but hey, this is a revision. All right, so what is a hadith and what does it mean to 
talk about hadith. It's a hadith class, but what does that actually mean? So the word hadith actually means, let's look at it right there. We did it yesterday, but we're going to do it again today. Look at what we're going to do. We're going to wipe everything out and we're going to do it again. And just so that we would give the chance for all our friends to actually see and get the chance to see each and every single thing. Here we go. We're going to wipe all this. This is what we did yesterday. I'm going to do it again. Ready? Here we go. Now, when we talk about hadith, what does the word hadith mean? So the word hadith comes from the root hadatha. The word hadatha means to happen. But the word hadith itself actually means the basically the quotes, the words, the, the words said, and so forth. In other words, when we're looking at hadith, what we're really learning, the quotes that the Prophet ﷺ had said, just the quotes, just the, the words, no. So it's a technical term. So this would be this would be the literal meaning of what hadith is. It's supposed to be just words mentioned. But the word hadith is perhaps technical term in the science of hadith. It basically went a little more comprehensive. Anything about the Prophet ﷺ in where ma sadara. I'm gonna translate everything. And if I if there's something that I don't translate, just raise your hand. Don't worry about it. And I'll inshallah translate. Ma sadara an Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam min qawlin aw fi'lin aw taqririn aw sifa. So what does that mean? So this is basically the definition of what a hadith is in the science of hadith. What does it mean? Anything that, here we go, anything that was said by the Prophet ﷺ, so that was said, in other words, a quote, or that was done by the Prophet ﷺ, or that was reported on the Prophet ﷺ, or a description on the Prophet ﷺ. So that's basically what a hadith is. But just because that was mentioned, it doesn't necessarily mean that... Okay, the sister is asking, when a person is constantly doubting his existence and choices, that is, there's, there, is there any meaning? Is there any purpose? Is everything about desires? And then question himself, am I allowed to choose? If a person is stuck in thinking like this, how do we get out of this? We'll talk about this. Remind me, dear. So this is a little off topic. We'll talk about this, inshallah. Okay, so when we're speaking about hadith, we would be talking about anything that was said, in other words, a quote, anything that was done by the Prophet ﷺ, but not because it was mentioned, done, reported, or whether it was a description on the Prophet ﷺ, it doesn't make it that I'm going to just take it because it was attributed to the Prophet ﷺ. So that's why the scholars had different classifications on, let's say, their scrutiny, their scrutiny for their, uh, their, their scrutiny for these hadith, and then they did their classification. And with the study, they would basically take every single hadith and they would have a certain classification for it. So the classification would be either that this hadith is sahih, or this hadith is hasan, or this hadith is da'if. Okay, so what does that even mean? So literally, the word hadith sahih actually means authentic, straightforward. So what do we mean by authentic? So authentic would mean that we would need to see that this person that narrated the hadith, وسلم, here we go, in where? مَا نَقَلَهُ الْعَدْلِ الضَّابِطِ عَنِ الْعَدْلِ الضَّابِطِ إِلَى مُنْتَهَى مِنْ, من غَيْرِ شُذُوذٍ and وَلَعِلَّةٍ قَادِحَةٍ Fair enough. Or, of course, uh, sorry, in where we're going to, well, so, oh, basically, I'm going to probably make it easier for you. I'm going to say, 
Isnaduhu. Here we go. Binaklil adl dabit. Here we go. Okay. So now we've got Matasala isnaduhu binaklil adl dabit. An al adl dabit. Ila muntaha min ghairi shududan wala illatan qadiha. So what do you mean by that? We would basically look at the transmission. And this transmission is going to be scrutinized, scrutinized to make sure that transmission within the narration, we're going to look at the chain of narration, and each and every single person within the chain of narration, in within the chain of narration, and make sure of the following, okay, within the chain. One, we're going to make sure of, number one, that this person is pious, that this person basically has the religiosity. This person has the integrity to basically transmit what was actually heard, what was said, and certainly without putting their opinion and or perhaps thinking that they're doing Islam a favor by somehow um, making up and faking their own hadith or who knows, manufacturing their own hadith or whatever it is. So we're going to look at the integrity, we're going to look at the piety, we're going to, well, that's not enough. You could be religious and actually make things up or you can, your brain is probably not competent so we're going to look at your memory and we're going to make sure that that is competent and you're capable of memorizing the quotes, you're capable of passing it on, you're capable of understanding this ilm and what you had heard and passing it on without any alteration. Well, it's not enough to just look at one person in chain of narration, but we're going to look at each and every single person. What does it mean to uh, look at each and every single person? That actually means we're going to scrutinize the, every single person just to make sure that we are not going to be seeing any quotes contradicting so contradicting anybody within um, the chain of narration. So every single person within the chain of narration technically was actually a scholar in Islam to help us understand, of course, what the Prophet ﷺ had said. So we're going to look at each and every single one. We're going to look at two things. We're going to look at what is called senad. And we're going to look at the metan. What is that? So the senad, we're not going to do this in this class by all means, but I'm just telling you what the science of hadith really studies. We're going to be looking at the chain of narration. The chain of narration is basically having all these profiles. There are these profiles that would basically list all these scholars and talk about whether they do have integrity, whether they are pious, whether their memory was tested to see how competent it is. And let's say the quote itself, they'll start looking at the quotes and basically comparing these quotes just to make sure no discrepancy, no contradiction with other notorious or other known scholars that had transmitted similar quotes, they would look into it and they would see for a illa. They would look and see whether there's contradiction, discrepancy, or perhaps words that are not necessarily accurate in uh, compared to other transmitters and so forth. So we would look at the chain of narration and we would even have all these books and profiles. They are called Tarajim. In the books of Tarajim, the books that contained all these profiles, they would list all the information just so that we would know that we are getting our ilm from those that really had learned it, those that had the integrity to pass it on, those that had the competence to really know what they're saying, and those that basically were at the highest level of transmitting the words of the process. So this is just 
one side. Now, we're not going to study that. So we're just going to look at some of the, let's say, the uh, basically the tahrij, basically the references. We're, we'll just probably just mention it really quick and say, well, hey, this hadith is authentic and here's who narrated it. And that's basically it. We're not going to go in details with that because that's a whole science in itself. The metan, on the other hand, is basically the actual wording the actual wording of the hadith. So we're looking at the metan, meaning the quote itself. What is it saying? And basically, we're really going to be looking at one person in the chain of narration, sometimes, not always, and we're going to be looking at the wording of the hadith. Okay, we'll, we'll be studying, inshallah, the wording of the hadith that relates to certain topics. Now, the other part, which is al-hasan. So this is the highest level of when we talk about the authenticity of a hadith. And let's say, how accurate is that um, in, in the study, in, in transmitting the hadith? Al-hadith al-hasan. We're going to copy paste this one right there and show you how slightly different it is. I'm going to poke, put that right there. The difference between these two in Hadith Hassan and Sahih is basically right there. The person has a poor memory in, compared to the person that had transmitted authentic Hadith. So, or memory and where we would see perhaps the wording itself for one hadith or for other a hadith that they had transmitted, we'll see that they had probably had a history of perhaps having a poor memory in the, the in, in transmitting the actual wording for the hadith. Hadith da'if is basically different because hadith life we're gonna quote again this one in where let's see what happens so if person was basically showing a poor behavior in their religion they weren't having the best integrity well then we're going to let's say monitor this poor integrity and this poor piety, and we're going to see whether that affected the transmission of the hadith. Yes, we're going to be judgmental here, because this relates that I'm going to be taking my religion, I'm going to be taking right there your words as basically the tool, the channel to go to the Prophet ﷺ. So I'm definitely going to be judgmental just to make sure that you are, one, religious enough and with integrity to pass on and transmit the words of the Prophet ﷺ. I'm seriously going to be uh, going to be scrutinizing you right there. I'm definitely going to be judgmental. And the second thing, because you're right there, going to be transmitting the words of the Prophet Sallallahu if you've got poor and and uh, you've got poor memory and perhaps maybe you've got an issue with how you would transmit the hadith and in that situation I'm sorry but I'm going to hold your words as at least at least a place that is deserving scrutiny a place of doubt a place of I'm of course um I'm not really sure of whether your words should be taken seriously or not and that's why it was classified as daif same thing if we're going to be looking at your words we're going to study the history of every single quote and we're looking at the history of every single quote we're seeing that you had a pattern of contradicting other scholars you had a pattern of perhaps with a poor memory or a pattern of uh, perhaps Maybe you were just constantly or you had a pattern of not having good religiosity, then we're going to definitely right there scrutinize some things and we're going to say, hey, I need to research this just to make sure that these people are really competent in order to transmit the hadith. 
So having that being said, you could see that da'if, hey, if we're talking about poor in their religion, poor in their memory, so that's why you had some scholars that classified a hadith that are da'if. Well, the word da'if actually means weak. So when we're speaking about weak, we're speaking about different areas. So that's why some scholars classify what is weak, a weak hadith. Some of it is actually talking about the person himself, judging their religiosity, judging their memory, judging the actual quote, whether they contradicted it, it contradicted other, let's say, uh, other <clears throat> other more uh, authentic quotes and so forth, then in that situation, you, you see that some scholars classified a weak hadith into 69 different classifications, others 40, others 32, others, and the list goes on and on in how they would classify whether this hadith, so why the classification? Because some hadith that are weak, they can consider that it's not extremely weak. It basically is within, let's say, an area that it is acceptable, but only on a condition that I would have Another, perhaps, another narration, another, even if it's weak hadith, probably intensifying this weak hadith. Let's talk about music for a bit. So music is actually within that area. Music, I'm not talking about words that are obviously wrong, but I'm talking about just the part about musical instruments. Are musical instruments haram or halal? Now, that's a thing in where we had so many different hadiths, but all of them are actually weak a hadith. So what are you saying? Well, even though they're all weak a hadith, can they intensify one another and make a strong statement? Is that even possible that I've got a hadith that is da'if and a hadith that is da'if and another hadith that is da'if in probably all together, even though I wasn't capable of proving the authenticity on the level or at least from the angle of the chain of narration, but I was capable of getting one statement that out of all these words, that's basically telling me that music contradicts piety for the least of it. Music is not something that would well, that would lead you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Music is definitely at least something not recommended. And the list goes on and on. So I'm not here discussing music, but I'm just giving you an idea in where we could see sometimes uh, we would see different weak a hadith and then some muslims would say that's it it's weak therefore we can't accept it not too fast some weak a hadith like for example a hadith that are called mu'annana mu'annana in uh, where that hadith mu'annan simply means that the person in the chain of narration, or at least the chains of narration, didn't necessarily say where, whether they had actually heard the words or whether they had basically off that person. It's exactly like saying, well, off Bintu, she said that, uh, let's say, uh, the, the water bottle is from the company Lotus. Let's just, you know, make a, a make a statement right there. And then she, I said, well, where, where did you get that from? She said, well, off Umayya and off Samira Umayya. And I would say, hey, where did you get that from? So I'll off Samira. She's the one that told me. And then off Tasneem, she also told me, and so forth. But then we would see that Bintu has a habit 
And so does Umayya and so does Samira in where they have a habit of sometimes not necessarily saying where she had really heard it. It could be someone else that said that and she didn't actually get the transmission directly word of mouth from Umayya or Samira or Tisneem, but it was that, oh, someone told her that this is what she said. And then you're not sure whether the trade chain of narration is complete or not. So that puts me in a place where this needs some scrutiny because I'm not really sure whether I can accept your judgment of considering that, well, I mean, just take that she's the one that told me this. And I don't necessarily have to specify whether she told it to me as a word of mouth or whether she had told it to someone else and she was basically our source and someone else told me this and so forth. So some would say, no, I really need really specific details to make sure that this information that was said is really here to be taken as because it's a religion, because this is a matter of quoting the Prophet I need to make sure that I know the method that was uh, that it was transmitted um, in, and I need to know who, and I need to know all the different details, whether you really met the person, and so forth. So some scholars would have another habit of what is called tadlis. What is that? Well, tadlis, they might say, well, um, something like um, Umayya told me uh, that uh, that uh, let's say the the water bottle is from Lotus, and but I would know that. Well, Umayya didn't even wasn't even present when the water bottle was there, so how could she say that? Bintu was the only person that was there. How was it that she skipped that that narrator? So she just went all the way to Umayya, basically giving me another narr narration. And she just said, well, um, she basically on that person or upon her or et cetera. And then what she wanted to give me the impression was that she was there even though she wasn't there, but she wanted to give me the impression, or that's the impression that I got. So that giving the impression part of it is a form of, definitely, it's a form of tadlis, in where it's a form of not being straightforward with your sentences or with what information you would transmit. So that's why, this is an example. An ana tadlis are basically examples um, that some hadith might be classified as weak, but we would still take them and embrace them within Islam. How do we understand that? Well, why? Because that's a classification in where you cannot compare this weak hadith, you cannot compare it to for perhaps things that are uh, compared to someone that is actually a liar. Somebody that's a liar, we definitely need to reject their hadith. We need to reject their hadith because they have a history of lying, making up hadith, and so forth. So in that situation, we cannot whatsoever compare a hadith that was uh, that was attributed to the Prophet ﷺ, but we know that this person is constantly lying and has a history of lying and making up a hadith and fabricating a hadith. We would basically look into the, the reason why this was classified as weak within just these general statements or general classifications. It's not enough. So some scholars would say, well, we need to look into the reason and based on the reason, whether it's in the chain of narration, whether it's in the actual quote in these lists, then that's what's going to determine on what classification we should be classifying 
this hadith as is it authentic is it weak what do we what does it look like so based on this classification we would then sometimes determine that although this hadith is weak we may take it as let's say something that we would apply in islam and we may take it as in fact a reference even in fiqh let me give you an example la darar wa la durar this hadith although it is one of maqasid al-sharia what does that mean it's a legal maxim in islam la darar wa la durar you should not harm others and neither accept harm in other words harm is to be eliminated period based on that we would say hey well that's what islam actually teaches in the quran and even in other hadith why can't we just take it as authentic and that's it well we don't just consider and classify something as authentic because it sounds good we would basically need to scrutinize to make sure that that's what the prophet sallam had said by looking at the chain of narration by looking at the quote etc now looking at that we didn't actually see that the person that had said the hadith was a liar or a person was tremendously lacking integrity or the person tremendously um lacking memory and then in that situation we would look into the wording and see we do have other narrators that also had mentioned la darar wa la durar so although it is weak we don't have an authentic narration sahih narration that is going based off these conditions but we do find that there are other weak narrators narrations that intensified this narration in other words i do have a strong statement there that has resources to support the authenticity at least but not necessarily based on let's say right there the actual conditions of what makes an authentic hadith so if i don't have what makes an authentic hadith and based on these conditions then in that situation i would have to abide by the rules that i had set the paradigms that i had set and based on these paradigms this does not fall within an authentic hadith and therefore i would basically have to put it as classified as dhaif based on that classification all right now one thing to say of course we're looking at um uh when we're looking at a hadith that are daifa there is something that is perhaps classified within the weak hadith but that's basically called the fabricated hadith or al mawdu'a the hadith that are mawdu'a are basically fabricated they're made up those are not whatsoever um to be taken in any way in fact it is haram to mention these um these hadith it is deliberately something that was lied attributed to the prophet sallam and believe it or not we even have books that are just to i guess bring about all the ahadith al mawdu'a that were there the most famous one is al la'ali al masnu'a fi al ahadith al mawdu'a and that's actually in almost 12 volumes what is suyuti wanted to do was basically give you all those uh, all those uh, at least um all those list of the ahadith that were fabricated so that way you would know that this is a fabricated hadith and of course we do have other resources like kashf al khafa would give me that and yeah we're, we're not going to go into details with that just for us to really learn how much of an effort the scholars had put in to make this ilm possible for us so this is just a 
a short summary of what we did yesterday, but we're not going to stop right there because we're excited to actually start the class itself. So let's see. Uh, let's see. What, what were you saying? Hold on. Let me see. Just making sure we're on the same page. And let's go over. Here we go. The hadith. Anywhere. What we're going to do, we're going to familiarize students with the science of hadith. That's what we just did. Analyze selected hadith and their historical, theological context. That were, that's what the, the hadith classes or the pearls of the Prophet. Salam, that's what it's going to be about. We're going to explore the applications of these hadith, of course, in our modern life. We're going to encourage, of course, critical thinking, personal reflection on Islamic teachings. How are we going to apply that and we definitely would like to hear your words now we're going to go to the actual hadith uh the actual structured hadith let's look into that and here we go let's see the other one um the pearls of the process setup. the first hadith in that is mentioned in every single book of hadith always starts out with this hadith innama al-a'malu bin niyat the prophet sallam had said innama al-a'malu bin niyat wa innama or wa innahu another narration li kulli imri'in ma nawa faman kanat hijratuhu ila allah wa rasulihi fa hijratuhu ila allah wa rasulihi wa man kanat hijratuhu li dunya yusibuha aw imra'atin yankihuha fa hijratuhu ila ma hajara ilayh that the prophet sallallahu had said that all the actions are determined based on the intentions whoever and whatever of course the person intends is basically going to determine the classification of whether this behavior is acceptable or not, or whether this behavior is acceptable at least to lead to Jannah, to lead to guidance or not. So whoever's migration is for the sake of Allah and his messenger, then their migration is for the sake of Allah and his messenger. In other words, then they'll get the reward based on that intention. Whoever's intention was to migrate for the sake of of a matter in this life or again in the worldly gain or a woman to get married to then their migration is for what they had intended for so a couple things here when we say well what does that really mean that every single behavior that you would do the what's more important than doing the behavior is the intention because the intention is going to determine, one, the application, the implication, and certainly the reflection and what it's going to lead your heart into, your soul into, your mind into, without you realizing that's basically what is going to determine who and what and certainly where this action leads to. So that's why the Prophet ﷺ would always, of course, this hadith, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَلُ بِالنِّيَّةِ is actually considered mutawatir. What does that mean? So mutawatir in the classification of hadith actually means a group of narrators had heard this hadith and they passed it on to another group of narrators and the, the other group of narrators passed it on to another group of narrators in other words it has a history of a group upon group upon group upon group of getting this hadith widely circled amongst all the different sahaba all the different tabi'in which is the second generation they were all circling around this hadith that every single behavior, it's basically your intention that's going to determine whether this behavior is going to be accepted or rejected. Even if the behavior was done right, even if the behavior was done right, we're looking at the intention. What did you mean by that? Did you mean, one, sincerity, that it would be done for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That you're getting and wanting that reward, that response from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not from someone else or not for another worldly gain, not for the sake of perhaps 
people speaking about you, which is called riya, or somehow getting some form of uh, interest, uh, getting some form of interest, probably a job, probably money, probably that, then in that situation, if that is the case, well, then you're really putting in an effort that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to reward you for. So looking at that, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ is basically right there. This is called أَدَاتُ حَصْرُ. What is that? It's, it basically means that this is a tool in لُغَ Arabiya in order to say that this is a, making it exclusive. That this is an exclu ex making it exclusive that all your actions are going to be determining the intention is basically going to be determining whether this action is acceptable or not. So the question is, فَمَنْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولَهُ What does hijra and what does migration have to do with any of this? What it has to do with it in the, the story behind behind why the Prophet ﷺ even brought this up is there was a guy that was living in Mecca. He was Muslim. He migrated to Medina, went to Medina, but not for the sake of going for hijrah and applying the order of the Prophet ﷺ that we have to do hijrah to Medina at least at the time because this kind of hijrah actually ended when the Muslims had conquered Mecca. In eight-year hijrah. So this was basically mentioned before Fath Mecca. Here's what happened. This man who was in love with a woman called Um Qais, he migrated to meet Um Qais, migrated to marry Um Qais. So the Sahaba were wondering, well, so he did migration to Medina, but he didn't do it for the sake of you. We know that he was in love with this, with this Um Qais. We know that he had basically done that just for this romantic relationship. Does he get the same reward? So that's why the Prophet ﷺ didn't say who. He just said based on the context and said, فَمَنْ كَانَ تَجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ فَيْجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ The ones that migrated for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then they're the ones that basically would get, one, the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Two, they would be the ones that their action would be considered that they were doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And whoever is migrating for us the sake of Um Qais or for the sake of a woman to get married to or a man to get married to, then in that situation they're going to be judged and definitely their actions are going to be based on that. Now you could see it says, Rawah al-Bukhari, you are Muslim. who are al-Bukhari and who is Muslim. So they're basically major scholars. Al-Bukhari died 200 and, uh, uh, well, 61 year Hijriya or 259 year Hijriya. And Al-Bukhari, his name is Muhammad ibn Ismail Al-Bukhari. Muslim is Qutayba uh, or Muslim ibn Qutayba. Uh, Muslim ibn Qutayba and he was Samarqandi. And both are actually from Uzbekistan. Muttafaqun alay is another, let's call it an abbreviation, which basically refers that it was narrated by Bukhari and Muslim. Let's see, who. well, who else is in that chain of narration? Abu Huraira. Abu Huraira, he is one of the Sahaba, one of the companions who was famous as Abu Huraira, but his name was not Abu Huraira. Abu Huraira means the, the father or the person that always had a cat. Abu Huraira Always had a cat. He just always had cats and loved feeding cats, loved, loved taking care of cats. So the Prophet ﷺ nicknamed him as Abu Huraira. The word Huraira means kitten, not cat, but kitten. Okay. And Hirra is basically the big cat, the mama cat. Okay. Huraira is basically 
to, to speak about a small kitten. So that was Abu Huraira. His actual name, according to majority of the scholars, is Abdul Rahman ibn Sakhr. Abdul Rahman ibn Sakhr. Well, that wasn't his name. His name was something else before Islam. That's why they had differences of opinions on what his name was before and what his name was after. And certainly the nickname of Abu Huraira was basically given to him by the Prophet Let's see another hadith. Hadith Jabir ibn Abdullah. Who's Jabir ibn Abdullah? Jabir ibn Abdullah was, uh, was a Sahabi. Uh, he had uh, a number of different stories with the Prophet ﷺ. And one of those famous stories, when the Prophet ﷺ was with him and Jabir ibn Abdullah was wanting to rush going back to his family, and Jabir ibn Abdullah, his, uh, the Prophet ﷺ tells him, well, did you get married? And, uh, well, at first, the Prophet ﷺ says, what's the rush for? And he said, well, I got married. And the Prophet ﷺ said, did you marry a woman that was a virgin? In other words, she was not married before. Or did you marry a woman that is not virgin? He said, no, um, she was basically married before. And so the Prophet ﷺ recommended that he would marry a woman that had never been married before. But he then explained that the reason why I married a woman that is older, a woman that had a history of getting married before, is because he had nine sisters and these sisters were young, so he wanted an older woman to replace basically their mother, to replace their father and take care of them, not be a young woman at their, you know, similar and close to their age and start basically fighting with them like she is basically, you know, the same age, you know, kids that are the same age, they would usually fight because they don't know how to communicate. They don't know how to create a channel of communication. They don't know how to be mature. They don't even know how to select their battles. They'll basically consider that every single disagreement is a big battle. Take it seriously and then off you would go in where the home becomes nothing but chaos. So Jabir ibn Abdullah told the Prophet Sallam that he married an older woman just so that she would replace the mother and would consider taking such a responsibility of being a mother to those girls rather than be, uh, let's say, a, a person that is at their eight within their age group. So let's see. The Prophet ﷺ, Jabir ibn Abdullah didn't just narrate that famous hadith, and the Prophet ﷺ did say, May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and bless this marriage. That the Prophet ﷺ said that Allah Almighty does not accept any act action illa ma kana khalisan unless it was sincere wa bitughiya bihi wajhu and it was aimed at the face of the lord almighty so aimed at the face of the lord almighty is simply saying right there that this is definitely a metaphor in other words your intention was directed at as uh, into wanting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so what do we get based on those two ahadith that makana khalisan that it is only supposed to be sincere for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and basically done that you would want the reward from Allah, that you would want to do this action in order to uh, in order to get Jannah, in order to get Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to see you, in order to get the the action to be applied for the intention of wanting whether it's praise, acceptance, or aim to be for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. bihi wajhu is an emphasis. So when you're looking at aimed at his face, is emphasizing what sincerity really entails. What sincerity really entails. Let's see another hadith. Hadith Muslim ibn al Harith. The Prophet said, Ida qama ahadukum ila salah. فَإِنَّهُ يُنَاجِي رَبَّهُ فَلْيَنظُرْ كَيْفَ يُنَاجِي رَبَّهُ I wanted to mention this other hadith. You could see right there narrated by Nasa'i, um, but inshallah it's an authentic hadith. Okay. إِذَا قَامَ أَحَدُكُمْ إِلَى الصَّلَاةِ That the Prophet ﷺ said, when one of you stands for prayer, 
He's in conversation with his Lord. So let him look into, uh, let him look to how he converses with him. The Prophet Sallallahu If you were to attempt to stand for prayer, so this right there, it's not just for about prayer, but the Prophet Sallam is teaching us how we would apply the whole idea of how do we create a relationship? What does it mean to be sincere? How can I work on my sincerity? How can I work on that relationship? So the Prophet Sallam was teaching us in where, look at the way you stand for prayer. When you do, and when you stand in prayer, how is that way done? You want to fix it? Sometimes your intention is not in place? Well, imagine, فَإِنَّهُ يُنَاجِي رَبَّهُ Put that within perspective. When you're standing up for salah, you're actually talking with your Lord Almighty. You're having a personal conversation, a personal conversation between you and Allah. So, فَلْيَنْظُرْ كَيْفَ يُنَاجِي رَبَّهُ Then scrutinize, look into, take the words and just look, ponder deeply into them. How, how are you speaking to your Lord Almighty? How is that done? What is the position that you're in? How are the words coming out? Are they coming out as a word of mouth? Or are they coming out as words that are vibrating into your heart? Let's move on right there. An Abi Musa. Who's Abu Musa? Abu Musa al-Ash'ari. Abu Musa al-Ash'ari was originally from the parts of Yemen. Migrated first to Al-Habasha, Abyssinia, and then migrated to Medina. The Prophet ﷺ talked about Al-Ash'ariyin and talked about Abu Musa al-Ash'ari was included when the Prophet ﷺ said, even though other Sahaba were there, and he said, يَقْدُمُ عَلَيْكُمْ Who? Well, the Prophet ﷺ describes them as قُلُوبُهُمْ أَنْقَى لِلْإِسْلَامِ مِنْكُمْ Their hearts are basically containing all the purity for Islam and even more than anyone else that was sitting there and sitting down with the Prophet ﷺ. Let's see this hadith. قَالْ جَاءَ رَجُلٌ إِلَى النَّبِي صلى الله عليه وسلم فقال يا رسول الله ما القتال في سبيل الله فإن أحدنا يقاتل غضبا ويقاتل حمية فرفع إليه رأسه قال وما رفع إليه رأسه إلا أنه كان قائما فقال من قاتل لتكون كلمة الله هي العليا فهو في سبيل الله عز وجل Let's say a man came to the Prophet وسلم, and said O oh, Messenger of Allah what is fighting in the in the way of Allah? In other words, what does it really mean? How is that really done? And the Prophet ﷺ said, or the man continued and said, well, for one of us fights out of anger and the other one fights out of pride. The Prophet ﷺ raised his head. And of course, the reason why he had raised his head is because the man was standing. Whoever fights so that the word of Allah is supreme. In other words, that's your main goal then that is the way of Allah Almighty. Let's look at this hadith. So the translation doesn't really give that same inspiration. So what does the man actually say? He was really concerned about what it means to be for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because, of course, when he's joining within the battle, he would have another intention within, of course, his actual action. He would fight, but sometimes it's basically the anger that is motivating him to go and fight. Or perhaps it's some form of tribalism, some form of uh, pride, and some form of he wants to get personal gain where he's accepted he's seen as a strong person he's seen in a certain way so the Prophet ﷺ looked up to him and 
just looked at him. And he said, Man litakuna kalimatullahi al-ulya. The ones that would, and whoever, would fight for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be the highest, to be the word that would that would be the main aim, then that's the what would determine whether that was for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or not. So how do we understand within all of this? Let's look at this one. Abu al-Aswad, well, on Abi Dhar, who's Abu Dhar? Sahabi, Abu Dhar al-Ghifari. Abu Dhar al-Ghifari was a Sahabi. He, in fact, he was one of the earliest ones to become Muslim. Sixth, the sixth person to become Muslim. Jundub ibn Junada is his name. Abu Dhar al-Ghifari was known to being this Sahabi from the tribe that was known as a tribe like a pirate tribe, a tribe that was a game tribe. Did Abu Dhar get affected by that or did he influence them? He influenced them. What happened? Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, he got in some form when his father died the one to take custody was basically, I guess, to take care of them was his uncle. But then his uncle later accused him of cheating, uh, basically with him, uh, basically cheating on, uh, cheating on him, basically with his wife. Abu Dhar couldn't handle such an accusation because he never did such a thing. So. Later, he heard that there was a prophet in Mecca that everyone's talking about. So Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, he aimed to go and check it out. Migrates all the way from his place of uh, place of uh, uh, place of living, outskirts and at least the northern parts of Yemen and goes to really search. Who is this prophet everyone's talking about? Is this for real? So he goes and sits, of course, watches. Where am I going to find this man? Where is everybody? Why is everybody not talking about this person? If I were to ask about him, I'd, he's probably right now being targeted. He's considered on the number one list. So how am I going to find this? He's sitting down. And just looking at the Kaaba. And while he was looking at the Kaaba, of course, just they, he was homeless. There was no one to sit, uh, to sit, uh, at least uh, no one to, or hotels to be. He couldn't even afford any of that. So he would just sit out there and just watch. And while he was watching, two ladies, basically, uh, they were doing tawaf around the Kaaba. Around Isaf and Naila, which two? Which two idols? Well, the idols that are basically were representing romance, representing a fahisha that was done. What was that? Well, Isaf and Naila, they were in love, but then their family rejected that they would get married. So they made an oath that they would commit zina right next to the Kaaba, and they did. So later, these two idols represented the love story of them committing zina right next to the Kaaba. These women were uh, basically worshipping these two idols. Abu Dhar is looking at this and looking at silly the how silly their actions uh, were. And he just said, you know, why don't you just connect between them by connecting them with a stick and that said and just get it over with. The two mushrikat, 
the two women that were not even Muslim, they started wailing and crying out and, and started yelling. And then the who passes by? Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and the Prophet Sallam. They're just confused. What, ladies, what's going on? Why are you yelling? And they said, this man had said something that is horrible. What did he say? We can't even repeat it. It is horrible. We can't. It's such a shame. It would be such a shame for us to even repeat it. Well, why is it a shame? He said something horrible about the gods. So the Prophet Sallam and Abu Bakr al-Siddiq were really, I guess, confused as well why would anybody say about the gods anything bad about the gods unless they don't believe in the gods so they go to him and they asked him what was it that he had said and he's oh this is what i said so then they held the conversation because they recognize that this person is rather smart Rather, not just copycatting everything and ev what everyone was doing. So they basically started telling him and asking him what he was doing. And he said that he was actually in search of the prophet that everyone was talking about. And he couldn't find him. So here it is. The Prophet ﷺ then, of course, tells him about Islam. He becomes the sixth person to become Muslim. That's Abu Dhar al-Ghifari. But Abu Dhar al-Ghifari was a person that was coming from a gang tribe, so he was ready to start snapping at the people right there. The second day, in the second day, he would stand in the mountain and start speaking and, and start reading the Quran right out loud and start announcing it. Left and right, he was getting beaten and he was being hit until... Of course, who was basically coming in tentative one uh, 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 basically um, uh, uh, one of the chieftains of Quraysh, he basically said, do you know who you're beating? You're actually beating somebody that is from the tribe of Bani Ghifar. If you are to attack this man, they'll come in in defense for their for their uh, son or for their member, and then we would not be capable of defending ourselves because those people are mighty people and definitely not to mess with. So they let him go. The second day, Abu Dhar al-Ghafari doesn't stop. He did it again. And again, they would start beating him up and left and right. He gets, you know, these punches left and right. And then again, it happens again. He said, this is the same one. What are you doing? If his tribe comes over in defense for their own, uh, for their own member, then we're going to be doomed. Let him go. The Prophet ﷺ sees that he's a man of a, he's a man of a mission. He's a man that would not let go. He's a mighty man doesn't care about the consequence. So he told him to go to his own people. And when he would do that da'wah, basically give it to his own people, and until he would hear that he would have to come and join the rest of the Muslim community, isn't until time had passed, the Sahaba were in Medina, Years had passed, years and years now had passed. And they thought all of a sudden, what are they seeing? Oh no, we're being invaded. And right there, how do they know that they're being invaded? By looking at that there is sand, which basically is an indication, people walking, horses, horses basically walking, that's a sign that they would see the smoke or something that looks like smoke from far, but it's actually sand. They thought that they were being invaded, but it isn't until it got closer that it was discovered that it was Abu Dhar, and a lot of people from his tribe had basically embraced Islam through Abu Dhar and were coming to join the Muslims in Medina.
they thought that they were being invaded. Let's say, Abu Dhar, he basically said, and they said, in uh, um, uh, the Prophet said, in Nabikulli Tasbihatin Sadaka, Wakulli Takbiratin Sadaka, Wakulli Tahmidatin Sadaka, Wakulli Tahlilatin Sadaka, Wa Amrin Bil Ma'rufi Sadaka, Wanahyun An Munkarin Sadaka, Wafi Budri Ahadikum Sadaka, Kaluya Rasulallah, Ayati Ahaduna Shahwata, Wayakunu Lahu Fiha Adr, Kala Araitum Lawadu. في حرام أكان عليه فيها وزر فكذلك إذا وضعها في الحلال كان له أجر. A group of people came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, "Oh Prophet of Allah, all the rich had taken all the good deeds, and they would pray as we pray, they would fast as we would fast, and they would have the money." to donate with what is even beyond their needs. The Prophet ﷺ said, well, didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you anything to donate with? In other words, something extra to give. As for the explanation, he said, with every single subhanallah, glorifying the Lord Almighty, that would actually be considered as a donation. Two, with every takbir, which is an abbreviation for Allahu Akbar, that would be a donation. With kul tahmid, that with every single alhamdulillah, the word tahmid is an abbreviation. With every tahmid, with every alhamdulillah, it's basically a donation. Three or four, with every tahleel, it would be a donation. What is the tahleela? La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. That's a sadaqa. Even if you don't have the money, money is not what is going to be going to basically be the only good thing that you would present. But no, wa amrun bil ma'rufi sadaqa. And even if you were to order for what is good, that's considered a sadaqa. In the forbidding what is evil is also a, a, a donation that you would present. And in fact, wa fi budri ahadikum sadaqa. And even if the man was not in for being intimate with his wife, but he was also wanting to share along with her. That's basically right there, a form of a donation. And they said, well, how is that the case? We would basically come and uh, right there and engage in a lustful behavior and a lustful thing, and we would still get rewarded for it. And the Prophet ﷺ said, well, speaking of analogy right there, أَرَأَيْتُمْ لَوْ what if he were to be intimate with someone that is not lawful unto him? Would he be considered as committing a sin? Well, definitely the answer is yes. So he responded, well, that's when. If he were to be intimate in a halal way, then they would basically get a reward for it. In other words, based on the intention. Let's say right there, and we're saying that charity, every declaration of faith, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, let's read the one in English, right? O Messenger of Allah, the people of wealth have taken all the reward. They pray like we pray, they fast like we fast, and they give charity from their excess wealth. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, Is it not that Allah has made for you what you can give in charity? Every glorification, subhanAllah, is a charity. Every declaration of greatness, Allahu Akbar, is a charity. Every praise, alhamdulillah, is a charity. And every declaration of faith, la ilaha illallah, is a charity. Commanding what is good is a, is a charity. Forbidding what is wrong is a charity. And in the intimacy of one of you, there is charity. They said, oh, Prophet of Allah, does one of us fulfill his desires and still have a reward for it? He said, have you not seen that if he were to place it in something forbidden, he would have a burden for it? 
Likewise, if he play, re, replaces it in something permissible, he will have the reward for it. You could see in where it was mentioned in Al-Bukhari and in Sahih Muslim. Let's see another hadith. The Prophet ﷺ said, إن الله كتب الحسنات والسيئات ثم بيّن ذلك فمن هم بحسنة فلم يعملها كتبت له حسنة وإن هم بها فعملها كتبت له عشر حسنات وإن هم بسيئة فلم يعملها لم تكتب عليه وإن هم بها فعملها كتبت عليه سيئة واحدة The Prophet ﷺ said, Allah has recorded the good deeds and the bad ones. Then he explained, if someone intends to do a good deed but does not do it, it will be recorded as one good deed. And if he intends and does it, it will be recorded as ten good deeds. If someone intends to do a bad deed but does not do it, it will be recorded against him. And if he intends and does it, it will be recorded as one bad deed. Let's see. It will, did I say it will be recorded against him? It will not be recorded against him. Let's see right there. For the Lord Almighty, كتب الحسنات والسيئات. Right there it says recorded. So كتب can mean decreed, can be recorded. In other words, every single action a person does. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the malaika, الكرام البرارة, and they would also be, those angels would be recording each and every single thing that one is writing. So he said, ثم بيّن ذلك. And then the Lord Almighty, of course, oh, sorry, the Prophet ﷺ, بيّن ذلك. Then he explained, that is the Prophet ﷺ, what does it mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was going to be writing what is good and what is bad what does that look like so whoever it doesn't start from just the intention when the actual uh, action is happening so he said فمن هم بحسنة فلم يعملها whoever intends to do an action and doesn't do it they just had the intention to do the good deed did they actually do it they didn't كتبت له حسنة they would get the reward for one good deed. Did they do it? They didn't do it. But if they did do it, they intended to perhaps help mom clean the dishes. They intended to do it. Did they do it? They didn't. They got one deed for it. But if they do do it, they will get 10 deeds for it. Right, Hudayfa? Right. وَمَنْ هَمَّ بِسَيِّئَةً Probably that he intended to hurt his mom or hurt his brother. But they, did they do it? No, they didn't do it. So then if they didn't do the bad deed, they didn't do the bad action, but they intended to do it, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not hold them accountable. Just because you got the idea to want to do something wrong, it doesn't mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to consider that you did something wrong. Not until you apply it. That's out of mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if the person does do it, then they're going to get one bad deed. Well, I want you to look at the one, one bad deed. So it's not necessarily one bad deed, and that's basically it. It would be one bad deed equivalent to whatever that was done. So if a person were to, let's say, kill somebody, that's a major that's a major sin. If the person were to commit suicide, that's a major sin. It's not equivalent whatsoever to perhaps maybe um, eat somebody else's apple. It's not equivalent whatsoever to that. That's a major sin and that's a minor sin or depending on the case. Let's look at this hadith and that's going to be the last hadith for today. Let's see. تفرق الناس عن أبي هريرة. What happened? تفرق الناس. تفرق الناس means people were joining around Abu Huraira. فقال له قائل من أهل الشام أيها الشيخ حدثني حديثا سمعته من رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. قال نعم. 
سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول أول الناس يقضى لهم يوم القيامة ثلاثة رجل استشهد فأتي به فعرفه نعمه فعرفها قال فما عملت عملت فيها قال قاتلت فيك حتى استشهدت قال كذبت ولكنك قاتلت ليقال فلان جريء فقد قيل ثم أمر به فسحب على وجهه حتى ألقي في النار ورجل تعلم العلم وعلمه وقرأ القرآن فأتي به فعرفه نعمه فعرفها قال فما عملت فيها قال تعلمت العلم وعلمته وقرأت فيك القرآن قال كذبت ولكنك تعلمت العلم ليقال عالم وقرأت القرآن القرآن ليقال قارئ فقد قيل ثم أمر به فسحب على وجهه حتى ألقي في النار ورجل وسع الله عليه وأعطاه من أصناف المال كله فأتي به فعرفه نعمه فعرفها فقال ما عملت فيها قال ما تركت من سبيل تحب قال أبو عبد الرحمن ولم أفهم تحب كما أردت أن ينفق فيها إلا أنفقت فيها لك صحيح إلا أنفقت فيها لك قال كذبت ولكن ليقال إنه جواد فقد قيل ثم أمر به فسحب على وجهه فألقي في النار So what happened? What happened? Abu Huraira, different people were gathering around him. And a man from the Levant, Syria, Jordan, Palestine, Lebanon, who knows, one of those areas. He came to him and he said, talked to him and he said, Ayyuha Shaykh, oh, of course, Shaykh, older man, tell me something that you had heard from the Prophet of Allah. And he said, I heard the Prophet, peace be upon him, say, there are three people that will be first judge on Judgment Day. A man that was killed, basically presented, killed in jihad for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, at least to what it appeared. فَأُتِيَ بِهِ He was brought. And he, the, Prophet, the, uh, the Lord Almighty, basically had exposed and told him, you recognize the potentials that I had given you. You recognize every different thing that I had blessed you with. And he said, yes, I recognize all those potentials. I recognize what you had given me. And he said, what did you do with those potentials? And he said, I fought for your sake until I was even killed. The Lord Almighty responds to him and said, kathapt. You're a liar, but you actually killed, fought for, fought in order to be known as a courageous person. And it was said, and so was said, then he was ordered and he was pulled on his face and thrown into hellfire. Another man basically learned different, of course, sciences in Islam, and read the Qur'an, in other words, a scholar in Qur'an. And he was introduced in where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exposed all the different bounties that he had blessed him with, the different potentials. Hey, this you were given this potential to memorize, you were given this potential to do this, you were given this potential intelligence, etc., to do different things. What did you do with it? And he said, I learned the I learned the the different sciences and I memorized the Quran. In other words, he was wanting to present it as well. This is what I did with you, with the intelligence that you had given me. This is what I did with all that you had blessed me with. So the Lord Almighty responds. As a matter of fact, you had learned. The sciences, you had learned Islam in order to be presented as a person of knowledge, as a scholar. And you had read the Quran in other, in, in order for other people to somehow, to somehow present you as a person that is a reciter. And so it was said. People 
had basically known you for that. You wanted people to praise you for it. Well, you got the praise. Then he was taken and thrown in hellfire, and another man was brought. This man was given the potential in, uh, in where, of course, what potential? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given him different types of provisions, different types of wealth, perhaps maybe animals, perhaps maybe crops, perhaps maybe houses, realty, and all of that. And then he was, it was exposed to him. You remember you were granted one, two, three, four. Yes, I do remember all of that. So he said, what did you do with it? He said, every single area that was important for me to invest in, I invest, invested in it. Now, Abu Abdul Rahman, right there, he said, I didn't, I don't remember. Of course, he doesn't remember whether he had said, kama uh, aratu an yunfaqa fiha, as whether he had said, uh, uh, whether he had said, I basically put the money in where what I considered or what was considered as the place where the money is supposed to go or whether or whether he had said I had donated for you basically contributed for your sake so Allah subhanahu wa responds كذبت ولكن ليقال إنه جواد you donated and contributed in order for people to say that this person is, is is hospitable, that this person is donating for people to basically recognize you as person that is giving away for good good causes. In other words, the interest that you really intending was the was the praise coming from people. And then that's when he was taken and thrown in hellfire. Actually, I couldn't stop at this hadith right there. Let's see right there. This hadith, last one. Abu Huraira also narrated the hadith. Inna Allah la yanzuru ila ajsadikum, wa la ila suwarikum, wa lakin yanzuru ila qulubikum. The Lord Almighty does not look at your bodies, does not look at your appearance, but the Lord Almighty looks at your hearts and what they conceal. And this is important to keep in mind that what really matters is one, lessons to be learned. One, our own intention. That it, it is for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Have the intention to do something for the sake of Allah to actually mean that you would recognize that he's the one that would reward you for it. Three, that you would recognize that just like in that hadith, if you don't know how to fix the intention, imagine on judgment day, you were present right before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and standing right before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ask you, what did you really learn the deen for? What did you really do all of this for? If you did it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then expect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give you the reward for it. How do I fix my intention? Should I stop something because I don't have the good intention for it? Don't stop. Continue. But work on your intention. How do I work on my intention? Recognize that you would only stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he would know the whole intention and what, was, what it was done for. So make it sincere. Make it only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and recognize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only looks at your heart and he doesn't look at your appearance. Does that mean I should not iron my clothes and not be? No, this is part of Islam. It's part of Islam to fix your clothes and appear in good appearance. Basically, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us. The dress of taqwa is the best. Libas taqwa is basically the best. So makes no sense to say, well, I'm here wanting to look beautiful. But then, of course, you're basically presenting yourself in a way where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had considered that that is not acceptable in how a woman would appear in. So looking at that, in where, in Allah, la yanduru ila arsadikum, the Lord Almighty does not look at your body and what kind of a gain you 
got, you got in this world, but he will look into your hearts. Therefore, that should be our place of focus. So um, this is the hadith we're going to stop at. Inshallah, we'll continue. You, uh, inshallah, continue with the, the rest of the ahadith. Let's just look at what, see, I've got a lot of ahadith to cover. But inshallah, we're going to be at least taking the pearls for the Prophet. ﷺ. And of course, we did how many ahadith? Should we count them? Let's count those ahadith, right? So we're going to basically right there, we're going to count those ahadith, right? Let's count them. Hadith number one, two, three, four, so those are four ahadith right on this page, five, six, seven, eight. We just did eight ahadith, not too bad. I didn't go into lots of details, right? Just wanted to basically just make it that. And I would really love to hear how uh, these ahadith inspired you. Go ahead. Um, if you would want to unmute yourself, go ahead. And then I'll answer khasatullah the question that you had asked. Inshallah. Well, I'm going to be choosing Sister Samira. Sister Samira, you're a teacher. I would love to hear how you can teach us. And Sister uh, Umayya as well, you're also a teacher. I want you, I want you ladies to teach me. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, myself teach you, Sheikha. Yes, we're all, you know, let me tell you one thing. Yes, even you teach me. The Prophet ﷺ said, It can happen that a person or a person that is basically getting مبلغ, in where they are getting the hadith, but someone else can actually be, let's say, uh, farther in seeing a certain inspiration. They could have even a different vision. So it's not at all to mean that I, as a teacher, basically had all the ilm, but no. You could say, well, here's one thing that inspired me that I probably didn't see, or another scholar didn't see, or someone else. It's like, here's an inspiration. Here's what how we could apply. So yes, definitely, you would teach me too. We're all together as Talibat Ilm anyways. Go ahead, my dear. I would love to hear it. Jazakallah khairin kaseera for the reminder of this um, hadith which appears in every book of hadith, the first hadith that the hadith that is there. Um, um, it was a reminder for me as to why I'm here today and why I am here in all the courses in, that I'm studying. So it was a jolt back. Allah yahfadik ya Rabbi. And Ustaza uh, Umayya, so Ustaza Samira and Ustaza Umayya, um, what would you want to tell me in that regards? There's going to be a lot, inshallah, to say. The, here, Khasatullah, you want to tell us something? She said, the scariest hadith is the second, uh, the second Hadith that is scary. This in Allah Allah bihi I think for me, the scariest thing um was basically this hadith. Let's see, this hadith was really scary. Uh because the person was actually notorious for uh, being courageous. The second one was notorious for being a scholar. The third one was notorious for giving out donations. And that's all scary and where uh, people actually had known you for that. And it's so scary. I guess I could relate in where I always have to remind myself to really be sincere. Um, although, alhamdulillah, I don't, I'm not necessarily known. So that's actually uh, good and bad. Um, it's good because it keeps me on track with my niya. And it's bad because we would basically uh, have to reach out with da'wah to get as much as and as far as we can um, with reaching out different people. 
So, uh, I mean, <laughs> subhanAllah, that, that hadith is extremely scary to think about. And I would love to hear how you had seen, um, khasatullah, that the second hadith is the scariest. I would love to hear that one. So this is the second hadith. How did you see that that was the scariest? Khasatullah, unmute yourself, dear. I think the last one uh, I was talking about, um, um, why do I think so? Like, um, uh, sometimes we ignore, uh, ignore our intentions. Uh, we focus on the action and uh, uh, unconsciously, subconsciously, we are thinking um, about ourselves, like... Um, uh, our zikr, our uh, uh, we love to be remembered by someone, or um, so um, and called by uh, like entitlement. So we love we love to be entitled, and uh, uh, personally, I feel uh, for myself like uh, I want to be recognized. I want to be so um, uh, so. That's why I think uh, second last for me. Uh, that is the scariest one uh, because uh, uh, that's uh, that's a word that matches my personality. Like uh, uh, I have to work on this. Love it, love it, love it, love it. Love the way you worded it. Good job, good job. Love the way you worded it. Let me answer a question you had um, put out there. You said when a person is constantly doubting his own existence and choices, um, that is there any meaning if a person is doubting their own existence um if you mean by doubting their own existence in where uh, they're doubting whether they're actually they're actually there or not uh then that is actually a form of I worry about mental illness if they're really wondering whether they're even, uh, you know, a uh, form yes, Sorry, of... I'm interrupting you. Uh, um, it is uh, sorry, diagnosed by the doctor, like a uh, psychologist, uh, a personality disorder, something like that. So, uh, so how do you see... Uh, right. Add... So with a situation of mental illness... If they're starting to doubt their existence, they're starting to, you know, have some form of psychosis and they're really living in a situation where they're not at least controlling their thoughts. Two things here. Number one, they won't be held accountable. Keep that in mind. Why? The Prophet, the Sahaba, one Sahabi came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, we would get these thoughts that if we were to voice them to us, the skies ripping open and the, the, the earth ripping open to us would be, uh, let's say, easier on us than voicing the, the words and the words of doubt, skepticism that are voiced in our heads. But then the Prophet ﷺ said, you would find that, you would sense that. And they said, yes. So the Prophet ﷺ responded to them and said, Alhamdulillahi ladhi radda kaydahu ila alwaswasa. I want you to look at this one. Where the Prophet ﷺ said, Alhamdulillah, that the plots of shaitan had found nowhere in the community in you, but in the area of waswasa. What is waswasa? Paranoia. So this is a form of paranoia. But the Prophet ﷺ basically comforted this Sahabi and told him that this is actually faith. Since you were concerned, and since it, you wouldn't be concerned unless you were really a person of faith, since you were really wanting to approach and ask since you were really wanting to pray but these thoughts were constantly coming in uh, onto your mind that is not whatsoever a form 
of taking you out of belief or out of faith because that is more of a waswasa from shaitan. It's a paranoia that the shaitan is inducing and not necessarily your faith being lacking. This is important. So when the person is starting to doubt their existence, starting to doubt their choices, and starting to doubt everything, then that's a form of OCD, paranoia. Then in that situation, it's a mental illness and not necessarily lack of faith. Can this happen? Can this happen to a, a person that is of, let's say, strong faith? Yes, it can happen, but that doesn't necessarily represent what they would believe in. It's basically the different sounds. It's basically the different things that the mind is is, is basically you know, having some kind of an imbalance in the brain. And this imbalance in the brain, uh, they recognize that it's not something that they believe in, but it's just constantly giving them this imbalance. Usually, you know, from my experience, usually this happens, of course, there are different reasons, but usually this happens after a trauma. After a trauma or due to anxiety, many times we would, I would get people come forward, probably the death of a loved one, or perhaps they lost uh, something in school, or they probably under so much pressure that their brains would start, you know, think of it as a, a, a glass of snow, the, the glass of snow and that ball. And when it gets shaken, in where all the ideas, they just get confused. And this person is starting to redo their wadu like five, six, seven times, 30 times, and probably repeating their prayer four, five, nine times, perhaps. And then they'll come forward and I'm not sure if I'm divorced or not. I'm not sure I'm this and this. But of course, some that's not to necessarily always say after all, always after cases of anxiety. So I'll let psychiatrists actually discuss all the details about which cases and what uh what uh triggers such uh such uh cases and so forth but um you know in islam this person is not held accountable they would only do their salah once only do their wadu once and they would always assume that their wadu was accurate their salah was accurate if let's say they were doubting that uh that they had divorced or they had they not divorced and what really happened uh they would just assume that everything is all fine so islam basically puts in i guess that training and where to let you learn how to stay with uncertainty and not let that doubt overcome your thoughts and overcome you and or even put you in a situation where you're doubting whether you are a person of faith or not just by you showing salah that's enough you're a person of faith by you saying ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa muhammadur rasulullah you're a person of faith don't worry about the thoughts that would come to you the prophet sallallahu called it waswasa called it paranoia and you're not held accountable for it is there any purpose uh, is everything about desires and then they question themselves what am I allowed to choose so that person they, it, it depends on how far their paranoia went if their paranoia went in uh, I guess uh, a severe situation where they don't know how uh, to determine their choices etc then in that situation that person would be classified within the classification of al matu what is al matu al matu is basically a person that has a mental illness where sometimes they would be sane and other times they would be really confused about what choices they're supposed to be making um confused about um about their uh about their life confused about everything and you could see that this person is at least having murky thoughts and uh in that situation we would definitely have someone act as their guardian uh in order to help them make the right choices so they would be the guardian or guardian at litem to basically uh let's say 
uh, guide them, uh, let's say mentor them to help them get the the, the treatment at least um, to make sure that they're making the right choices. Now, is it wrong to take medications? The answer is absolutely not. Taking medications, mental illness is just like any other illness, whether we're speaking about physical illnesses, cancer, different illnesses, that's the same way. That's exactly the same way. Our 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 minds, our brain could also go into the same form of any other illness. And sometimes we would definitely need to see psychiatrists. We would definitely need to see specialists to help us at, at least get this balance in place and help us work on getting our our behavior, our cognitive skills, our skills, and make sure that this person gets treatment. And it does not contradict a person's faith uh, by getting treatment and seeing psychiatrists. So just wanted to note that. If the person is stuck um, thinking like this, definitely see a psychiatrist. Um, they are the ones that are specialized to help you get the treatment that is necessary. And this is not whatsoever um, requiring, uh, let me go get the ruqya and just let Ruqya somewhat, somehow help me. No, you definitely can use Ruqya as an aiding thing to, let's call it spiritual healing. You can use Ruqya, but don't necessarily think that Ruqya is the only treatment. Just like if a person, God forbid, were to get cancer, that doesn't mean that we're just going to tell them to just take the Quran and start drinking uh, water that is holy water and that they should be getting cured. No, drink holy water, do your Ruqya, and also get the, the treatment that is known, that is studied, that is reviewed, and just to make sure that you are getting the necessary treatment, the necessary help, at least that is known, research and review to make sure that you are not necessarily living in a delusion, thinking that, yes, I'm getting the treatment, but every single day there is a dawa. For every single illness, there is treatment, whether we're speaking about the illness, mental illness, or whether we're speaking about physical in illness, definitely see specialists. Um, the psychologist, uh, well, I would say if this person is going through this, I wouldn't necessarily say see a psychologist. I would see a psychiatrist. A uh, psychologist is more giving you talk therapy. Um, that definitely can help, but definitely see a psychiatrist if it's going that uh, if it's going that far in where the person's doubting their own existence and going into all of that, I would definitely see a psychiatrist. Um, a psychologist would be a secondary thing to, I guess, help with uh, giving the, uh, I guess, treatment uh, and uh, some form of uh, therapy and learning how to focus, learning how to go beyond such uh, such illness and so forth. So the psychologist, she said that they would research about shaitan. Um, well, I mean, no, I would not, I, I would not agree with the psychologist to research about shaitan and not at all. And the reason for that is when a person is starting to doubt in starting, and I don't mean that the doubt is triggered because of a misconception. A doubt that is triggered by a misconception, that's when I would recommend getting an education, learning more, and so forth. But if the doubt is going as far as doubting your own existence, that's a mental illness. That's, that's a mental illness on the spot. And with a person that is going through this kind of mental illness, this kind of paranoia, the last thing I would want them to do is get an education. That's the last thing I would want them to get into. And what I mean by that is... I don't want them listening to debates. I don't want them getting into listening to lectures about refusing such statements and all of that because their brain is right now not competent it is not capable of processing the ideas it's basically going through an imbalance anyways 
So to tell somebody, for example, that is lame and tell them, hey, I want you to practice walking and I want you to, um, you know, somehow uh, get into um, doing physical workout to help you is actually wrong. It depends. If they have a fracture, the last thing we would want them to do is put pressure on it. And that's the same thing. And when even if a person had a muscle, uh, some kind of a muscle tear, we don't want them to, uh, I guess, excessively work on that on that body. So it's the same thing in in uh, situations where some uh, someone has this type of paranoia, uh, this type of a mental illness, et cetera, then I would definitely say, I want you to st stop right there listening to these lectures. I want you to stop and I want you to focus perhaps definitely work on your dhikr, work on that piece of it. But if the misconceptions are coming from that angle, I don't want you right now to research um, because that's putting more pressure on your brain and you're going to start doubting every single thing. And ironically, the doubt that they are trying to refute your brain could mistakenly, uh, instead of listening to uh, in focusing on the rebuttals, you'll be focusing on the misconceptions right there. Your brain is constantly going to take the misconception. Instead of looking at the rebuttals, you're going to look at the, the misconception. And you're going to take in more and more misconceptions. And you're going to start getting even more confused. So in situations of paranoia, no, I don't um, recommend at that moment, learning about Shaitan and learning about all of that, I would recommend doing an internal type of therapy, uh, internal type of therapy and help the person relate to the dhikr. Yes, definitely read Quran, definitely um, make dua, make dhikr. But along that, definitely see therapists, definitely see psychiatrists to help with that treatment. Um, so... Um, and I hope I answered that question. If the person that is asking the, the questions is is out there as well, I would be happy to listen to the, uh, uh, to uh, further questions relating to that topic or even other topics. Go ahead, my dear. You can unmute yourself if you want. All right. So this is it. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So this is it. Inshallah, we will see you all in tafsir class in 45 minutes, inshallah. And then hopefully see you again in our pearls. Um, invite others. Definitely, inshallah, um, we will continue sitting with the pearls of the Prophet ﷺ. And subhanakallah, alhamdulillah, nastaghfiruka wa natubu laik, nashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Jazakillah khairan. Wa iyyakum.